Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we celebrate a book that has, for a lot of us, been the first thing that we read to help us plan our travels to Europe. So please, put your travel dreams in the upright and locked position as I have the pleasure to introduce our host for the evening, Rick Steves. Hey, Rick. Lisa, thank you for that nice introduction. We're gonna have a good time tonight, getting a little bit nostalgic, talking about the most important skills of European travel and making sure that we incorporate those skills into our travel dreams so we can travel smartly, smoothly, economically, and with maximum experience. It's so nice to be able to open the door digitally and have a couple thousand people barrel into my living room here as we do every Monday night. <laughs> And I just want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us on Monday Night Travel and um, explain that this evening we're going to celebrate the 40th edition of this book, Europe Through the Back Door. In the last couple of weeks, I've been all over the United States giving lectures and so on. And I was also in Italy uh, teaching our new guides how to tour guide the Rick Steves way and updating some of my Rome book. And I've been thinking about the celebration we're going to have tonight as we track the evolution of this book from its first edition, self-published, typed by my girlfriend in the dormitory when I was at the University of Washington, illustrated by my roommate, and taken in the back of my old beater Oldsmobile up to a publishing house half an hour north of Edmonds here with $2,000 and a stack of uh, how many pages? 192 that's a multiple of 16 I think because it had to be certain signatures and I came back a couple of weeks later with 2000 copies of this book in my car and that was the beginning of me as a travel writer and I really learned when you become when you when you publish a book people think you are smarter than you actually are and it gave me momentum to establish this teaching that we do and we're going to track how this book has evolved over 40 editions to here I was paging through this book. This is a first edition, 1980. I can't really open it because the spine breaks. It's a rare first edition. So I've got a third edition here, which is totally open and broken, but that's what I referred to. But it's just got all of these memories. And this is from a day when I would actually go to the bookstore that stocked the book and I would put this little flyer in there, Rick Steves Budget Europe Travel Classes. And on the first Sunday of each month, our World Travelers Slide Club meets. You're welcome to drop by with slides or cookies just to talk Europe. Hey, that was 1980 and we're still doing it, but we're doing it thanks to modern technology and we've gone national with Monday Night Travel. But I was looking at the changes in technology. I mean, back then you hitchhiked, you slept for free, uh, some hotels didn't have hot water all day long. Actually, we had as one of the survival phrases in here, at what time is the water hot? You don't need that anymore. <laughs> you travel generally without reservations. Well, you have reservations these days. You had to concern yourself with mail stops because you didn't have an internet. How are you going to be in touch with your loved ones? You're going to stop by the American Express Company right there in Paris or in Amsterdam, where all the travelers would gather together and sell their used cars and trade their tricks of the trade. Uh, you had to change money in the black market in Eastern Europe. Uh, people did whirlwind tours. You know, we sold the Eurail Pass of all 20 countries around Europe, and people did the, if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium Blitz. There was not a lot of information. Back when I started Arthur Fomer Europe on $5 a day, then the Harvard students wrote the Let's Go Europe books, and there were the Michelin Green Guides that gave you a dictionary kind of coverage of the great sites. But there was not a lot of information. Today, the challenge is there's too much information that needs to be curated. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how some of the travel skills have changed, and we're going to visit the last half of this book. The first half are the, are the skills, and the last half are my favorite discoveries, the offbeat gems of Europe. And uh, we're going to visit, we're going to go to the Cinque Terre, Dingle, Dartmoor, North Ireland, uh, Rotenburg, Castle Day in Bavaria, Gimmelwald up in the Alps, and we're going to go to Eastern Turkey to Gazelyurt and talk about how those great sites, my favorite sites in Europe, have evolved over the ages. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to start off right now just to um, uh, show you a little bit about how things stay the same. I'm going to show you a clip that has me giving the same travel tip on my TV show 25 years apart. We're going to be talking about jet lag and we're going to be talking about the importance of 
a money belt. So check this out. And uh, you'll notice, uh, well, first of all, it's a pretty schlocky beginning of our TV show because it's way back to the 1990s. And uh, over time, things get a lot better. Join us now as we discover the ins and outs of travels in Europe. Okay, so here I'm stepping into a hotel room. This is 25 years earlier than the clip you're about to see. And I'm going to whip my money belt out and explain to you the importance of it. Right now you can see my uniform back in the very early days in the 1990s. Simple hotel room, simple wardrobe. I'm going to do a switcheroo on you here when I reached onto my money belt and I'll come back 25 years later. You'll see a nicer hotel room and a different wardrobe, but the same exact voice. The voice didn't change. Neither does the travel tip. As you've heard me preach before, solve this problem simply by wearing a money belt. It's a nylon pouch you tie around your waist and tuck in like your shirt tail. In it, you carry just your essentials so that you can wear it comfortably all day long. Jet lag. So the money belt is just as important now as it used to be. Jet lag is another thing where the tip doesn't change. Here I'm giving the tip, uh, I'm going to cut it in half, I think. I'm going to give the same tip exactly the same twice, 25 years apart. Big hates bright light fresh air, and any kind of exercise. Jet lag hates bright light, fresh air, and exercise. Get out and walk. So looking through the book, through 40 editions, a lot of the fundamental skills do remain the same. One thing I remember I stressed really strong right from the start was to respect the importance of planning a smart trip, planning your itinerary. Here's a clip that talks to you about how we Americans who have the shortest vacations in the rich world can cut through all the superlatives and make an itinerary that is not trying to jam too much into a short amount of time. Check this out and then consider the importance of all of these skills and how they still I think they still make sense to this day. At the edge of Siena's medieval center, our hotel's garden is a fine place for reviewing some ideas on itinerary planning. Start your travel experience early by enjoying the planning stage. Talk to other travelers, choose books and movies with your trip in mind, nurture your travel dreams. Then, develop a thoughtful itinerary in steps. Brainstorm a wish list of destinations and put them in a logical geographical order. Then write in how many days you'd like to stay in each place and then tally it up. This heads up to 32 days. Now it's got to fit to your vacation time. I've got 21 days off. That means I've got some serious cutting to do. Minimize redundancy really don't want to do both the Italian Riviera and the French Riviera, I'll cut the French Riviera. Keep a balance between big cities and small towns. This itinerary is pretty heavy on big cities, so I think I'll cut Rome. That'll save a few days. Greece takes just too much time to get to. It'll have to wait till another trip. Rather than spend an entire day on the train, you can save a day of your itinerary by flying or taking the night train from Bavaria to Venice. I still have to cut one day. I think I could tighten up on Paris. I had given it four. We'll do Paris in three days. When I add it up, it fits. 21 days. Now fine tune your itinerary. Anticipate closed days. For instance, in Paris, museums are closed on Tuesdays. That's a good thing to keep in mind. And you can take your trip to the next level by researching and planning for events along the way. Concerts, sporting events, and festivals. It brightens your experience. Consider building in a few slack days. Two days on the beach midway through the itinerary, that'll recharge those batteries. And one night stops are hectic. Try your best to have two nights in a row at a minimum. And remember, open jaws, that's flying into one city and out of another. In this case, Amsterdam and London saves time and money. That's efficient. Finally, be realistic about how much you can cover. You'll always find places you just can't get to. I really wanted to get to Greece, but squeezing it in would rush my entire trip. Assume you will return. Travel is freedom. It's rich with choices and exciting decisions. That's part of the appeal. Factor in your comfort level with doing things on the fly. Lots of people have a great trip with nothing planned at all. Others have a great trip by nailing down every detail before leaving home. I like to keep a little flexibility in my itinerary. Perhaps I'll fall in love with Siena and stay an extra day. Also, plan thoughtfully to get the best weather and the least crowds. 
The most grueling thing about travel over here is the heat and crowds of summer, especially in Italy. Check the weather charts. My rule of thumb, north of the Alps is like Seattle or Boston. South of the Alps is like Southern California or Florida. I prefer visiting the Mediterranean countries in spring or fall, and I travel north of the Alps in summer. We happen to be here in August, and it's hot. Winter travel's a whole different scene, and it has its pros and cons, too. Museums are empty, flights are cheaper, and the high culture, symphony, opera, and so on, is in full swing. But in the winter, it rains more, and it gets dark early, especially in the north. And many activities and sites are closed or run on shorter hours. While small towns, outdoor sites, and resorts can be sleepy, big cities are vibrant and festive throughout the year. You know, one thing I would say about looking at those skills from so long ago, and those were basically the skills I was talking about in the early editions of Europe Through the Back Door, it's impractical generally not to have reservations nailed down for your hotels from beginning to end. I'm really sad to say that because for me it was fundamental to travel was the freedom of not having reservations. But these days hotels are so expensive and there's so many people going to the places we want to go that you, you're smart to nail yourself down and, and trade away the flexibility for knowing you've got those good um, accommodations uh, reserved. Also the heat and the crowds of summer, I, it was interesting to me that I mentioned that there uh, because that was a concern decades ago, and it's a, even a bigger concern now. The heat is a bigger concern, and the crowds are a bigger concern. What I would like to do now is um, show you uh, just a few slides that kind of talk about the skills of European travel and the road we've taken as teachers uh, European travel in the last 40 years. Remember that first book came out back in our hippie days. Uh, this was in the 1980s that I first started teaching. And this was our first edition. Uh, I just wrote this book. It was the, basically I gave a lecture that I was giving all over the place to the pages here. And this was the class I was giving in book form. This is my buddy from high school, Gene Openshaw, on the day we graduated from high school. And we've got the biggest backpacks we could find, exterior frames. We had tube tents, mess kits, all sorts of ridiculous heavy stuff. And we were not packing heavy, that's for sure. But we had the adventurous spirit. We had the trip of a lifetime. And I had so much fun with my buddy Gene on that trip. I think, um, yeah, here's a, in this book, the very first editions of Europe Through the Back Door, I think you can see it right there. Uh, you know, sketches drawn from photographs I took in that early trip. Um, it was big to see the famous sites, of course, seeing the Eiffel Tower and all that, of course. But what I noticed in my travels was I was finding these special places. And I've been talking about them for literally decades ever since. Hill towns. Uh, we're all looking for the greatest hill towns. Of course, this is Civita di Bagnoregio, two hours north of Rome, keeping its head above the flood of the 21st century so beautifully. Um, we got the best of the Riviera, the Italian Riviera, the Cinque Terre. That was one of my first discoveries. And when I went to those places, we'll see a clip of it later, no tourism at all. Of course, today there's plenty of tourism, but these were the back doors. Now, the flip side of finding the offbeat places is finding the people, connecting with the people. I used to joke, if you see four cute guys sitting on a bench, ask them to scoot over. Nothing's going on. They're sitting on that bench every day. Get to know them. Be an extrovert. I was just thinking of slides to share with you today, and I, I remembered this slide, and this was during communism, and uh, you know this guy was the hammer and sickle kind of worker, and I met him, and I grabbed the hammer, and he had the sickle, and together we compared notes. He taught me, in fact, I think he even said, if you choose to have a low rung on society, you can live a more free life because you've got nothing to lose uh, if you are choosing a higher life a fancier, more important profession, then you got to be really careful about what you're going to say. But he could talk freely with me during communism, and we had an unforgettable connection. It was just beautiful. But that's what carbonates your travel, is meeting the people. And that is part of, that is integral to going through the back door. Going through the back door 
means catching Europe by surprise. That's the name of this book, Europe Through the Back Door. And that was the name of our company until we decided to call it Rick Steves Europe. My dad came up with that name. And he just said, we were up at our cabin up in the Cascade Mountains. And we were, I was fiddling around with what should I call the book? And he said, you know, you're going through the back door. It's kind of um, intimate, it's casual, it's familiar. And I thought that's exactly what we're looking for. We're trying to find the back door, not going through the front door, going through the back door. That's where you catch Europe by surprise, not formal, not all dressed up, not ready to see you, but honest, candid. Later on in this hour, I'm gonna take you with clips to the Cinque Terre, to Dingle, to the Moors of England, to North Ireland, uh, to Rotenburg, to, to the castles of Bavaria, to the mountains of Switzerland and Gimmelwald, and then we'll go to Eastern Turkey, to Gazelyard, and we'll have a chance to look at, in three minute clips, my, some of my very favorite backdoors, and we'll talk about how they have fared in the last 40 years. I was all about cheap travel, very cheap. That's what I needed. Cheap hotel rooms, $10 a bed. You get a kitten tossed in for no extra. What a delightful budget trick. Of course, you don't even have this option now if you wanted to travel this cheap. But back then, this was an option, and this is what a lot of people opted for. Uh, picnicking, that was how you ate back then. But you can see I had my Michelin guide there, the green Michelin guide at my feet. That was the most important guide in so many ways for me, as I would save money at lunch so I could uh, afford to go into the palaces and the galleries and the great museums. It was very interesting as a budget traveler. I mean, traveling around with almost no money. I did my first trip on like $3 a day. There were musicians with boxes full of money, and they would just welcome you to come up and help fund your travels. And they would play the Four Seasons while I uh, figured out how I was going to pay for dinner. You went to a cafeteria, and they actually had good food plated on racks. You could go in there and pick what you like. Budget travel, baby. And I was writing it all down, writing it down, journaling like a <laughs> journaling like a maniac. I had this, I'll just show you a little, but I, I, I filled these uh, empty books. And for eight years in a row, I'd fill these empty books with tiny, tiny writing. And I would gather it. This is before I really thought I was going to be a you know, professional travel writer. If you look here, you can see how much it cost back in those early, early days. This was my first trip without my parents in 1973. And you can see, well, if you look at this tally, and even this is long before I was going to be a travel writer, uh, before I even gave talks. Um, I was just graduated from high school, but 70 nights in Europe, average cost per night, 84 cents. 20 nights in hotels or pensions, $1.90 a night average. 17 nights in youth hostels, Half of that, 83 cents a night average, 32 free nights, nine nights sleeping out, 10 with friends, one on the plane, 10 on trains, one on a boat, and one in a hostel, and one night on Cleo's roof, a dollar each. Wow, it's amazing that you could do that then. I mean, accommodations are in one night, you'd spend more than, far more than what I'm spending on in 70 nights on that trip. Well, I learned from my slumming around Europe. And I, I put together a talk. It was, didn't make any excuses about it. European travel, cheap. Uh, Experimental College, University of Washington, 1978. It was experiential. Look at England is talking to me. Feel my fjords, caress my castles. And this was the Europe that I was in love with right from that early age. I had two all-day classes. I had an all-day budget travel class and I had an all-day art class. I would go anywhere I could get a crowd. Every weekend I would teach it, it seems like, when I wasn't in Europe. Saturday, all day long, seven hour, six hour talk. And then Sunday, for those who wanted it, I would take you back to Europe for more art. The art class is something that's interesting to me because I've always thought, and I mean, I forget about my own history until I look at these old slides, but I always appreciated the fact that Europe is more than just um, packing, lighting, catching the train and finding a hotel. Europe is appreciating the culture. And from the start, I wanted to complement the skills with the art appreciation. And I had this all day art class, six hours. Well, that's what I've been producing for the last couple of years for public television, a six hour series on the art of Europe. Same thing I was teaching way back then. The Europe Through the Back Door book, this must have been the fourth or the fifth edition. When I finally got a publisher, it was intentionally, no hotels, no restaurants. I didn't have to bog down in all those kind of details, those, those um, 
you know, just overwhelming details. But what I realized is people need guidebooks that cover the details, hotels and restaurants. So I opened a floodgate of work by deciding not only to have the skills book Europe through the back door, but to have individual guidebooks to countries and cities. Of course, I need a staff for that. I've got the greatest crew in the world, 100 amazing people, hardworking, passionate, talented, mission driven travelers that are all on my team. And together we make this series of guidebooks. And because of this team that we've got and our passion for accuracy and helping people travel well, our guidebooks dominate in the market. I mean, my publisher just visited a couple of weeks ago and he loves to bring up the sales figures. And he reminds us, for example, with this uh, photograph here or this uh, uh, image, 12 out of the top 15 best-selling Europe guidebooks have Rick Steves on the title. Um, not because we're that great, I don't think, but because other publishers are just phoning it in. They're not produced by travelers for travelers. They're produced by corporations that are trying to make money. We're trying to help people travel better, and that's good business. So over the three or four decades that I've been doing this, I've had a sort of an evolution. My focus has been first Europe through the back door, the skills then Europe 101, the history and the art, and then travel as a political act, how we travel in a way that broadens our perspective. It sees culture shock as a constructive thing, not something to avoid. Culture shock is the growing pains of a broadening perspective. It just needs curation. And that's what we provide in our tours, in our books, and in our TV shows. Uh, if you look at the first edition of our budget travel newsletter, backdoor travel, do it yourself, budget travel newsletter, Winter 1982, letter number one, printed every now and then to fill the void in travel journalism. Well, um, you can kind of see what our mission was. Seattle is a city of travelers, unmatched in the USA. Globetrotters who have been bitten by the travel bug lack togetherness. We need a medium for sharing discoveries. That is precisely the purpose of this newsletter, to pool information for the mutual benefit of all travelers. There's no publication like this written by and only for the traveler. Oh, baby. And then look at the World Traveler Slide Club. I was just thinking about that. I was reviewing these slides uh, earlier today. This is what we are gathering in right now. This is the, the, the nucleus of what Monday Night Travel is all about. The World Traveler Slide Club, open to absolutely everyone. The WTSC is just like MNT. It's simply a club of travelers that has a monthly get together to share slides, stories, ideas, and have some fun. We meet the first Sunday of every month at Steve's Studios. That was my piano teaching studios in downtown Edmonds. Every month, focusing on a European area and a show and tell theme, which is based completely on member participation. This year, we have set a monthly country theme and so on. The last sentence, mark your calendar, bring some slides, some cookies, a friend, or just show up. The Kodak projector is set up and the coffee pot is on. Let's travel. Well, that's what I'm loving about Monday Night Travel and our crew and all of you who join us each Monday night. That's the ghost of the World Traveler Slide Club, alive and well, deep into the 21st century. So I was a piano teacher and I was uh, finding that um, the parents were sitting on boxes of my first edition of Europe to the Back Door when their kids were performing uh, their Christmas recital. And I decided I got to do one or the other, teach piano or be a travel writer. And I decided to go with uh, traveling. Uh, eventually, we started our tour program, minibuses. At first, um, yeah, just women took the tours. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, actually, I know why. The women wanted to do what the, the guys were doing, but it was more safe to have a small group. So the women could have the adventures the men were having um, in more safely by being together on a minibus. And I got to be the driver slash guide. Well, that whole passion for guiding and teaching and writing is now with a staff of 100, technology beyond our wildest dreams, and I'm still doing exactly what I've always done, spending 100 days a year over there, making mistakes, taking careful notes, and uh, bringing home the hits. And that's the 40th edition of Europe Through the Back Door. It's the skills, it's the travel dreams, and it's the places. By the way, we've got a special t-shirt to celebrate this uh, occasion. And I would like to show it to you because I'm excited about this T-shirt. Um, this is the, the T-shirt that it celebrates the 40th edition of Europe Through the Back Door. And on the back, this is really cool. Dave Herline is our map maker. Dave was my first employee back in the 1980s, a fellow student at the University of Washington. And Dave makes our beautiful, intimate, cozy, real maps. He's a cartographer who's been there. And here, 
you can plan your trip on the back of your travel partners, uh, on the back of your travel partner. And uh, we've just located the, our favorite back doors in this uh, t-shirt. But that's available on our website, along with the brand new hot off the press edition of Europe through the back door. You can always go to the web store and check those out. Hey, right now, I want to um, take you to one of the back doors. And this is the Cinque Terre. And I'm just going to read the text from the first edition of the book. Um, a sleepy, romantic, and inexpensive town on the Riviera without a tourist in sight? That's the mirage travelers chase around busy Nice and Cannes. Psst. The most dreamworthy stretch of the Riviera sleeps just across the border from France between Genoa and Pisa. It's Italy's Cinque Terre. Leaving the nearest big city, La Spezia, your train takes you into a mountain. And then minutes later, you burst into the sunlight. Your train nips in and out of the hills, teasing you with a series of Mediterranean views. Each scene is grander than the last. Azure blue tinseled in sunbeams, carbonated waves hitting desolate rocks, and the occasional topless human camped out like a lone limpet. Wow. Now, when we look at this first clip of the Cinque Terre, the joy of the region is the same, but now it's quite touristy. It's got infrastructure for bigger crowds and it's quite expensive. Uh, and there's been a huge change in the number of fishing boats in the fishing fleet because they're almost fishing the Mediterranean out. But the magic of the Cinque Terre is definitely still there. Let's go check that out right now. We're going to take a trip to the Italian Riviera. The Cinque Terre, which means five lands, was originally described in medieval times as the five castles. Tiny communities like this grew up in the protective shadows of their castles. Their people ready to run for refuge at the first hint of a Turkish pirate raid. As the threat of pirates faded, the communities grew with economies based on fish, olives, and grapes. Today, the big employer is tourism. Each rugged little town is a variation on the same theme, a well-whittled pastel jumble of homes filling its ravine. These days, the castles, which used to protect the towns from marauding pirates, guard only glorious views. This 10-kilometer stretch of the Italian Riviera is the rugged alternative to the more glitzy Riviera resorts nearby. I just had a deja vu of my very first trip there. It was so beautiful. And I was hiking from town to town. And uh, I remember I got a brutal sunburn on my on the on my uh, the back of my legs as I was hiking because it was the first time I had done a long hike on the Mediterranean and each village was its own little adventure. There was almost no tourism there. I don't think there was more than a couple of serious hotels. And uh, the hillsides were thriving with people working the fields and making the wine. It was just a delight. I couldn't believe my good fortune to find this place. And I wanted to bring it home and tell everybody about it. The traffic-free charm is a happy result of its natural isolation. Just sun, sea, sand, well, pebbles, and people. For me, this is Italy at its most relaxed. For a home base, choose among the five villages. Each has a distinct personality, gently and steadily carving a good life out of the... And I can say, these have not changed one iota in 40 years. I mean, visually, the, the buildings are exactly the same because it's a national park and nobody can change their buildings. And that means there's no comfortable hotels. It's just a warren of little B&Bs and tiny pensions. And uh, I think that's one reason the charm of the Cinque Terre is still there. It's still there physically. Difficult terrain. Until the coming of the train and tourism, these towns were very remote and heavily dependent upon the sea. Even today, traditions survive. While nothing like past generations, small-scale fishermen still earn their living working their nets while the tourists play. And each day, restaurateurs count on these men to keep their diners smacking their lips. And each of the five villages actually retains a distinct dialect. Every village has a different dialect. What's an example? An example for talk about married. In Vernazza, is a sposal. Sposal. And if you're married in Rio Maggiore? Accompagnato. Very different. 
So when you hear somebody, you know what village they live in. Yes, sure. From the main street, you can pop into a series of narrow stepped lanes called Karuji. These zigzag every which way. In the densest parts of town, these lanes become interior passages. If you keep climbing, eventually you'll pop out up at the top near the castle. Handy. So when I look at that and I think of changes in 40 years, in a big city, you'd have lots of changes. You hardly recognize a town 40 years later. But in a town like this, it's essentially the same. But things have been prettied up because it's no longer a poor town. Now it's capitalizing on the tourist trade. So the castle has been renovated. The, the stonework is beautiful, as you'll see in a couple of seconds. There's gardens there. And uh, a big change, to be honest, is a lot of the local people have moved to the big city. And they've got an absentee kind of, uh, well, they're absentee landlords. And they've hired uh, people from Eastern Europe to run their bed and breakfasts. And they'll sleep in a closet somewhere and rent out to the tourists. And that way they'll make their living for their retirement. So uh, Airbnb and, and you know, bed and short term rentals have uh, invaded these towns and it does change the character of the business in the towns. But the, the vineyards, the hikes, the cactus, the ruined castles, all of that is just as charming and intoxicating as ever for fleeing attacks. The castle is nicknamed Belforte, the place of loud screams for the warnings shouted from its tower back in pirating days. A tower has stood guard here for a thousand years. Visitors climb to the top for the view and to imagine past raids. Okay, now we're going to go to Ireland, the west coast of Ireland. And uh, Ireland's very popular. We, a lot of us and at Brick Steve's Europe, call it Italy with rain. <laughs> and Ireland has uh, the big city Dublin, but of course you want to get to the west coast. And if you want the ultimate in Irish folk culture and so on, you go to Dingle Peninsula. And uh, one thing about, one thing that uh, Ireland has changed a lot is because of the EU, which didn't exist 40 years ago, uh, more people are speaking uh, traditional Irish language, the Gaelic, than, than they were 40 years ago. And you'll find a lot of towns are going back to Gaelic. A lot of uh, people are speaking Gaelic, uh, which you didn't have uh, when we first visited and discovered this for our American travelers. But let's go to Dingle here and see what that's all about. In Ireland, you drive on the left. On narrow roads like these, take your time. Everybody works together in a scenic do -si do up and over the mountain. With the help of a good map, I often take the slow, more memorable route. The dramatic Connor Pass leads to the scenic southwest tip of Ireland, Dingle Peninsula. Over a hundred inches of rain a year give this area its famous 40 shades of green. Dingle Peninsula offers an ideal mix of far and away beauty, archeological wonders, and desolate walks or bike rides, all within convenient reach of its main town. My Irish dreams have long been set here on this sparse but lushly carpeted peninsula. The people of Dingle are close to the land. When I asked a local if he was born here, he thought for a second and said, no, it was about six miles down the road. When I asked if he'd lived here all his life, he said, not yet. Dingle is so traditionally Irish because it's another Gaeltech, a region where the Irish culture survives, subsidized by the government. While English is always there, the signs, menus, and songs often come in Irish, or Gaelic, first. Teenagers from Ireland's big cities come here for summer camp, filling old-time school rooms to learn the traditional language and Irish ways. Time. Can us time, eh? Time. We'll toss the sauce to your Alicia. Anna Hosta. We'll toss the sauce to the re. We'll toss the sauce to the re. Tommy. Oh, Anna Varfa. Time. Toss the sauce to the re. And here, Irish songs are sung in Irish. And old churches do double duty as concert halls, where those enthusiastic about traditional music share their art.
Well, you know, I was just thinking there's a good thing about tourism. That's a beautiful slice of uh, traditional Irish culture. And it's thriving today to a great extent because tourists who visit will pay, you know, a few bucks to go to the church that evening and enjoy the local concert. Uh, we do a lot uh, when we uh, uh, travel uh, and consume thoughtfully to keep the local cultures vibrant. The town of Dingle is the perfect home base for peninsula explorations. It's just large enough to have all the necessary tourist services and a steady beat of Irish folk music. Although a popular tourist destination, Dingle still has a relaxed feel. This is a place where the fish and the farm still matter. A faint whiff of burning peat fills its streets. Tractor tracks dirty the main drag. And 40 fishing boats still sail from its harbor. So our next stop, on our series of back doors is southwestern England into Dartmoor. And Dartmoor is a place that I, I discovered a whole bunch of these little, for me, amazing uh, enclaves of traditional life and culture uh, in the same year or two. And I realized I had a critical mass of these great sites to put into a book. And this is a chance to, I uh, stayed in the youth hostel and I explored the moor and I've been going back ever since. And the moor is timeless. And timeless means it does not change. Check this out. A short drive further north takes us out of Cornwall and into the neighboring county of Devon, where we venture into remote and windswept Dartmoor. Perched on the edge of the moor, the tiny town of Chagford is an easy home base for exploring Dartmoor. The small town atmosphere here makes you feel like you've stepped into a time warp. It has a classic English village feel with a picturesque church and cemetery, and cozy pubs that double as inns for hikers to spend the night. One of England's most popular national parks, Dartmoor is one of the few truly wild places left in this densely populated country. A moor is characterized by open land with scrubby vegetation. England's moors are vast medieval commons. Rare places where all can pass, anyone can graze their livestock, and, in the case of Dartmoor, ponies run wild. Dartmoor sits on a granite plateau, and occasionally, bare granite peaks called tors break through the heather. Rising like lonesome watchtowers, these distinctive landmarks are the goal of popular hikes. Haytor is the most famous of these rocks. For the tenderfoot, the climb to its summit can be a challenge. It's not El Capitan, but it's hard to beat that king of the mountain feeling and the rewarding views that come with it. A well-planned walk through the moors rewards day hikers with vivid memories. Stone slab clapper bridges, some medieval and some even ancient, remind hikers that for thousands of years, humans have trod these same paths and forded these same streams. Tall stones guided early travelers. This one, erected by pagans long before Christianity arrived, was later carved into a cross. The iconic ponies of Dartmoor run wild. Their ancestors were the working horses of the local miners. Living in the harsh conditions of the moor, these ponies are a hardy breed known for their stamina. Today, they're beloved among hikers for the romance they bring to the otherwise stark terrain. So next up is a little uh, moment I had when I was uh, still a student and I came to this stone circle in Dartmoor for my first time. And I gotta say, this is exactly where I decided to become a travel writer. I'll tell you why in a moment, but watch this. Of the hundreds of Neolithic ruins that dot the Dartmoor landscape, the Scoral Stone Circle is my favorite. Tranquil and nearly forgotten, erected some 4,000 years ago by mysterious people for mysterious reasons, it's yours alone, the way a stone circle should be. It's just you and your imagination. Enjoy the quiet. Ponder the 40 centuries of people who've made this enchanting landscape their home and the wisdom of today's English to protect it and keep it pristine. Wow, 
I just got to say, wow, I, I'm, <laughs> I love thinking of stumbling upon that stone circle. And, you know, a couple days later, or a couple days before I had gone to Stonehenge, and it was the famous stone circle, and there were the tour buses there, and the barbed wire, and the porta potties, and the tourists with their blow horns, and it was just not a very soulful experience. And then I was all alone there. And I was on the boat to France a few days later, and I decided, you know, I found these cool places. I could collect them in a book, and I could share them, and other people could learn from my experience and travel better. You know, I've got... I've actually got the original handwritten from 1979 or something like that here up through the back door. And when I look at this thing, it's, it's amazing to me that, or how it survived, I don't know, but I've got, <laughs> just been sitting in a box for decades, but this was um, what I wrote that became this book. And the whole spirit of this is to take the magic that I found in Europe and combine it with the practical tips. I mean, you're going to pack light? You're going to pack light, pack light, pack light, pack light. <laughs> you're going to go open jaws? Well, there's a little map for you right there that talks about how, how you go from USA to one end and then home from the other end of Europe. These were just the practical tips that I put into this. In fact, I'd like to show you just a few slides that I can kind of walk you through this if you'd be interested. Um, because it is... I think pretty cool to think how this information is essentially the same after 40 years. Um, here's my mom holding the first edition of Europe to the back door back when the spine didn't break when you opened it. But if we look at this, uh, you know, bear with me here. I'm going to read a little bit of this to you because my, my penmanship was really good back then to compare what it is now, but it's still hard to read. But this is um, uh, Europe through the back door. Most people enter Europe through the front door. In fact, seeing Europe this way has become commonplace, almost blasé. So I'm writing this when I'm 24 years old, 1979 or something. Let me make your trip special. Come with me through the back door. A warm, relaxed, personable Europe will greet us as an intimate friend. We can become temporary Europeans, part of the family. We will approach Europe on its level, accepting its way of life, appreciating its different ways. We will demand nothing, nothing, except that no fuss is to be made over us. We will feel its fjords and caress its castles. Spending money has very little to do with the enjoyment of your trip. In fact, spending less money will bring you closer to the Europe you traveled so far to see. The most important decision you will make is which door to use. In other words, The first half of this book is devoted to the skills of European travel. And then in the last half, I'll give you 15 keys to some of Europe's most exciting back doors. And then I added on the bottom here, it's quite a mess, sorry about that, but a lot of money will force you through Europe's grand front entrance. You'll receive the formal, polite, and often stuffy treatment. But through the back door, well, that's a different story, a story I'd like to tell. Uh, so that's the story I'd like to tell. And then there was just basic skills that really don't survive to this day. People don't sleep on trains much anymore. But back then, this was a major thing for backpackers around Europe. Uh, how to sleep on the train. That was actually a chapter. The big sleep. Arrive 30 minutes before your train leaves. Walk most of the length of the train, but not to the last car. Choose a car that is going where you want to go and find an empty compartment. Pull out the seats. You know, the seats pull out so you can make a bed and sleep if nobody sits across from you. So you need two seats to make a bed. Pull out the seats, close the curtains, turn out the lights and pretend you are sound asleep. It's amazing. At 9 p.m., everyone on that train is snoring away. A car may have 10 compartments, each capable of sleeping three or sitting, seating six. The first 30 people on that car have room to sleep. Number 31 will go into any car with the lights on and people still sitting up. The most convincing sleepers will be the last to be, quote, woken up. And then I talk about different crude ways that you can uh, make people choose to sit elsewhere. For instance, a more interesting way that works equally well, and not nearly so rude, is to sit cross-legged on the floor and chant religious-sounding, exotically discordant harmonies with a faraway look on your face. 
People will open the door, stare in for a few seconds, and leave, determined to sit in the aisle rather than to share a compartment with the likes of you. For those sleeping, chanting, or with their foot on the door, the last minutes are the most tense. There are always a few people wandering around looking for a less crowded part of the train. When the train jolts into motion, you may breathe a sigh of relief, but don't relax for another five or ten minutes. If by then you still have your space, you'll probably sleep well that night. Ah, that was a big deal. Reading that just brings me back to that. I mean, because if you succeeded in getting a place to stretch out, you had six or eight relatively comfortable hours. But if you had to sit all up all night, that was no fun. Eating and sleeping, the five commandments. Back then, when I wrote the first edition of Europe's The Back Door, this was the text. I could get eight good hours of sleep and three square meals a day in Europe for eight to ten dollars a day if my financial situation required it. It doesn't, and I'd prefer to spend a little more money when I have it and be looser with my budget. If you have any budget limits at all, these basic rules of thumb should be kept in mind. For instance, number one, budget for price variances. Remember, the expensive countries are up to three times as costly as Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Italy. If your budget allows $15 a day, you should do the cheaper places on $10 a day, so you'll have extra money for the places where $15 buys you very little. One philosophy I have, if I starve, I starve where my suffering will save me the most money. If I decide to live like a king, I do that, where my splurge dollars will go the farthest. For example, in Sweden, walk, sleep on trains, and picnic. In Portugal, take the taxi to your comfortable hotel and have fresh seafood in a waterfront restaurant. Adapt to European tastes. The most unhappy people I meet in Europe could find the source of all their problems in their own stubborn desire to see, to find the USA in Europe. If you accept and at least try doing things the European way, besides the obvious budgetary advantages, you will be happier and learn more in your trip. You cannot expect the local people to be warm and accepting of you if you don't accept them. Things are different in Europe, and I hope that's why you go. As I said before, it's a package deal, and you have no choice but to accept the good with the bad. If you require the comforts of home, hmm, you better stay there. So that's just a little bit of the philosophy of traveling through the back door. It was a time when you could get sick just by drinking the water. I spent a little time on the toilet back then because of drinking the water. And uh, I even put how do I want to see a doctor in six different languages in the first edition of that book. Back then, people did the whirlwind tour. That was a big deal. I sold a lot of URL passes, and uh, by far the best-selling URL pass was the all Europe, 20 countries or whatever. This was the Blitz tour, two months. That's the trip I did on graduation, like most kids did. And I just love this itinerary. It's the best trip I think I'd ever taken in Europe. And uh, we covered it very well on that first book about Europe. One thing I discovered when I looked at this book, the uh, you know 1982 edition of this book, in the end of it, there was an ad for Bread for the World. I forgot I was with them so long ago. We just raised a million dollars because 5,000 of you each gave $100 and I matched it. And that was just Christmas 2023. But back in 1982, on the back page of the book, many Americans failed to realize how richly blessed our nation is until travel opens their eyes. Millions of people work for 20 years and earn less than what you will spend on this year's vacation, $2,000. As Americans, we are gluttonous kings of the money mountain. I'm a little more um, careful with my words now. It's natural to feel a little self-conscious about this inequity. If you don't, please read Bread for the World by Simon or Rich Christians by Cider. One whim of our government to encourage economic development and free trade can make or break a third world country. Bread for the World is a Christian lobby uh, organization that effectively pushes for government sensitivity to the plight of the 70% of mankind who share just 13% of the world's wealth. By working with Bread for the World, you can trade your passive concern to real action. But what was interesting, I thought, was this very last paragraph. When I travel, I take as much money as I expect to need with me to Europe. If I return home with money, I give half of it to people who will never see their name on a plane ticket through Bread for the World or a good international charity. If this book causes you to bring home some extra money, may I challenge you to do the same. It's a nice way to end a trip. Thanks from millions. Well, that's what travel does to you. It tunes you into the realities on this planet. And that's a big part of the travels that we promote 
at Rick Steves Europe. Hey, speaking of good travels, I want to remind you when you have good travels, you pick up a taste for good wine. And I'm drinking, a lot of people like to know what's Rick drinking here for his Monday night travel. This is Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. You've seen this before. I have a case of this wine. And uh, Cantucci is one of the vintners that we visit in the town of Montepulciano. It's in my guidebooks. And I just, if you've seen Adamo, ah, he's a wonderful man that loves pouring wine for his travelers. But this is a Sangiovese grape. And Sangiovese is the beautiful grape that uh, distinguishes the nice corposo, the full-bodied red wines of Tuscany. The Brunello di Montalcino is a Sangiovese. And this Vino Nobile di Montepulciano is sort of the poor man's Brunello. And it's really good. And it's a great value. And I love that. I hope you're enjoying some good wine right now or whatever you like to drink. Hey, I want to uh, thank, before we go on, I want to thank our crew at Monday Night Travel, uh, Gabe, Ben, Lisa, and our newest member, Emily. Our team makes Monday Night Travel possible and makes it happen. Uh, next Monday, uh, Lisa Friend and Colleen are going to be uh, hosting a special um, evening on Umbria in Italy. Uh, two weeks from tonight, we're going to Budapest, and Gabe and one of our favorite Hungarian guides, Andrea Mackay, is going to be uh, hosting that evening. Right now, I want to go back to some, uh, oh, I wanted, I do want to remind you, we're going to do questions, so if you have any questions at all, we'll have plenty of time for questions later on. Add them into the Q&A link there, and if you go to the chat link, you'll find links to anything we're talking about, like the t-shirt, if you wanted to get the copy of the 40th anniversary nostalgic t-shirt with the great specially made map highlighting all these beautiful places that are off the beaten path back doors you can find that uh, on the website our new t-shirt and in the uh, I'll link to it in the chat section okay now it's time to go back and upcoming is a chance to go to northern europe northern ireland and i want to say in this case when we go to northern ireland this was a long time ago it made the cut for the first back doors 40 years ago and it's always been an example of political travel. You go to Northern Ireland and see how things are doing with the, with the troubles, with the Catholic community and the Protestant community. Um, Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, it's complicated. And when we go there, we humanize it. Here is a little look at Northern Ireland. And for me, no tour to Ireland is complete without going to the Republic and to the North. Northern Ireland is part of a group of islands called the British Isles and part of a political entity called the United Kingdom. The Emerald Isle is comprised of the independent Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. The northern region is also called Ulster. From the capital, Belfast, we travel to fun-loving Portrush, to the rough-and-tumble city of Derry, and enjoy attractions along the Antrim coast. Here in Northern Ireland, sightseeing makes more sense with a little background. All of Ireland was once ruled by Britain, but the Irish didn't assimilate quite according to plan. While Britain was Protestant, most of the Irish were Catholic. And with these religious differences came a deep-seated cultural divide. To help bolster its control, London planted settlers, Protestant settlers, mostly from Scotland. These people became the Scots-Irish, the dominant ethnic group in North Ireland today. But centuries of British rule led to strife. And in the 1920s, after a bloody war, most of Ireland became an independent country, Catholic and ruled from Dublin. But the North, with its Protestant majority, opted to stay with Britain. And the island remains divided to this day. You'll see symbols of that division throughout Northern Ireland. Protestant orange parades are common. Several thousand a year during marching season, between Easter and early September, fill the streets with sectarian pageantry. You know, one thing I want to break in here, I've been thinking about walls lately because there's a wall between the West Bank and Palestine and Israel. Uh, there, there's a wall between the sectarian communities in Belfast, and there are walls all over this planet, either physical or metaphorical. And the walls, were built for whatever reason, but the unfortunate impact of a wall, it keeps the younger generations saddled with their parents' fears and their, their, their parents' baggage. And the key to, to peace is for sectarian communities to have the younger generation get together and realize, hey, we're in this together. It'd be a lot better if we just learned uh, to give each other a little wiggle room and respect and understand our context. Well, this kind of a parade right here is an exercise in older people teaching their kids to be hateful, frankly. And when you see this, you'll see the little kids here. Think of the tragedy of regions that are so divided that they're going to war with each other. And think of the tragedy when the younger generation can't figure it out. Of course, Ireland ultimately solved its troubles. 
because heroically and smartly, the Irish sectarian communities decided, let's get the kids together. And there was all sorts of programs to let the kids go to summer camp together and dance and play together. And they grew up thinking, we don't want to bomb each other. We want to just uh, live together on this beautiful Emerald Isle. While 90% of these parade through Protestant towns and are therefore peaceful, a few are antagonistic, marching through Catholic towns and neighborhoods. Far more political than your average parade, these are like pep rallies for the cause of continued union with Britain. A chance for parents to share their political passions with their kids. The long-established Orange Order works to defend the union with Britain, so their political philosophy is unionist. Orange is the team color, and the Union Jack is its flag. This is countered on the Catholic side by nationalists and Republicans, people who want the entire island to be one nation. Their color is green, and they fly the Irish flag. And by the way, where they fly the Irish flag, you'll find Palestinian flags, and when, where they fly the Unionist flag, you'll find Israeli flags, because Ireland is paying the price of people who were planted there by a colonial power. England planted Scottish Protestants in Ireland to get a toehold on that Catholic and Irish island, and centuries later, they're paying the price. And the settlers that are going from Israel into Palestine, those are planted people in somebody else's territory, and centuries from now, people are going to be paying the price from that. That's why when you look at Ireland, the Protestant community has an empathy with the Israelis, and the Catholic community has an empathy with the Palestinians. Consequently, they tend to fly each other's flags. In the Republic of Ireland, there's no question, Catholics rule. But here in the Protestant-dominated North, the Catholics with over a third of the population are just too big a minority to ignore. In order to maintain control, Protestants employed policies which were tough on Catholics. This escalated tensions, which led to the Troubles, which have filled headlines around here since the late 1960s. As Protestants and Catholics clashed, the British Army entered the fray, and they've been here ever since. Thankfully, real progress towards peace has been made recently, and while you still don't want to sing Protestant songs in a Catholic pub like this, or vice versa, Northern Ireland has become a great place to visit. Nice. Now we're going to go to someplace a little lighter, and that would be Rotenburg on der Tauber. And this is an example of a place that's very touristy. But if you can understand why it is so attractive today to so many tourists and understand that's because it was really great and important five or 800 years ago, we can see through all the tourism, we can ramble the ramparts after hours, and we can be turned on by the magic of that place in spite of the fact that it's very touristy. One of the key skills in European travel these days, because so many places are so discovered and so crowded, is to enjoy it when the crowds are not there and to enjoy it by bringing more understanding so you can take more joy out of it. In three hours, we're in Rotenburg, Germany's ultimate walled city. In the Middle Ages, when Frankfurt and Munich were just wide spots on the road, Rotenburg was one of Germany's largest cities with a whopping population of 6,000. Today, even with its crowds and overpriced souvenirs, I love this place. During Rodenberg's heyday, that was about 1200 to 1400, it was at the intersection of two great trading routes, Prague to Paris and Hamburg to Venice. But today, the great trade is tourism. Rotenburg is a huge hit with shoppers. True, this is a great place to buy cuckoo clocks, steins and dirndls, but see the town first. Most of the buildings were built by 1400. Like many medieval towns, the finest and biggest houses were built along Herengasse, named for the Heron, or the wealthy class. The commoners built higgledy piggledy farther from the center, near the walls. Hanging shop signs advertise what they sold. Knives, armor, bread, whatever. Rotenberg's wall, with its beefy fortifications and intimidating gates, is about a mile around and provides great views and a good orientation. Rotortor is the only tower you can actually climb. It's worth the hike for the commanding city view and the fascinating display on the bombing of Rotenberg in the last weeks of World War II, when much of the city was destroyed. 
But Rotenberg's most devastating days were 400 years ago, during the Thirty Years' War. In the 1600s, the Catholic and Protestant armies were fighting all across Europe. The Catholic army took the Protestant town of Rotenburg. And as was customary, they planned to execute the town leaders and pillage and plunder the place. But the Catholic general had an idea. He said, hey, if somebody in this town can drink a three-liter tankard filled with wine in one gulp, I'll spare the city. According to legend, Rotenburg's retired Mayor Noosh said, I can do that. Mayor Noosh drank the whole thing, the town was saved, and the mayor slept for three days. And today, tourists gather on the town square several times daily for a less than thrilling reenactment of that legendary chug. Nice story, but in actuality, the town was occupied and ransacked several times during that 30 years of war. And when peace finally came, Rotenberg was never again a major player. It slumbered peacefully until rediscovered in the 19th century by those same romantics who put the Rhine on the Grand Tour map. They came here to paint and write about the best preserved medieval town in Germany. Shops are filled with etchings and prints inspired by this 19th century romantic take on the town. And Rotenburg is lined with other shopping opportunities. And you can see it's got plenty of tourism, but if you're there early or if you're there late, it really is a chance to be lost in the wonders of that cobbled, half-timbered wonderland. And it's just a matter of being out and about when the tourists are not there, early and late. Hey, now we're going to go to one of my favorite ruined castles in all of Europe. And this is another example of your, everybody's going to go to Mad King Ludwig's Castle, Le Schwanstein, just over the border, a short Actually, just a, a walk away, you can hike there easily, in Austria is Ehrenberg. And Ehrenberg has changed a lot because of one man, Armin Walsh. You're going to meet him in a minute. And in the 40 years that I've been going there, he has been um, turning this hill-capping medieval castle into a cultural uh, lesson uh, for the Tyrol. And uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful experience uh, today, thanks to the work of Armin Walsh. A hike up to the stark and brooding ruins of Ehrenberg Castle provides a striking contrast to Ludwig's fantasy castles. Historian Armin Walsh is spearheading a project excavating and developing what he calls an ensemble of castles, which will create a unique open-air museum. We have uh, an ensemble of castles, four elements built in different periods. We start here in the Middle Age uh, with Ehrenberg. We have a Gothic uh, element in the valley. We have a Baroque castle and we have a, a brand new fortification system of the 18th century. We're visiting two castles of the ensemble, the 13th century Ehrenberg and, higher on the right, the 17th century Schlosskopf. This is a very and when I was a kid, I hiked to the one on the right and it, it looks like it's been peeled back like your scalp before you have brain surgery. All the trees were taken down so they could excavate the castle. But when I went up there, it was lost. Nobody knew it existed. It was, a, it was a woodsy wonderland. And it was just an enchanting thing to check out. One of the most romantic experiences I had ever had when it comes to exploring a ruined castle. Today, it's protected, it's a museum, and it gives us an amazing look at the history of the Tyrol. It's a strategic place because it lies on the 2000 year old Via Claudia Augusta. This is a a road through the Alps, which connected Venezia, Italy, with Germany. And this road was also in the Middle Age very important because it transported salt, the white gold. Anyone who controlled the castles controlled the trade. So in the Middle Age, they had to find the perfect hilltop to build the castle. A steep hike takes us up to the bigger and more modern Schlosskopf Castle, which Armin and his crew have just recently started uncovering. Well, Rick, um, two years ago, nobody in this town knew, or only few people knew that there was a fortification on top of the hill. Two years ago, you couldn't see anything. Uh, it was covered with trees. So you shaved this off? We shaved it, we cleaned it. It was completely covered with trees. So from right there, you couldn't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, well, <all> right. <laughs> 30th century castles like Ehrenberg were built uh, with tiny walls, high towers on hills because of uh, the defense system of the Middle Age. Then they invented cannons. Cannons made this kind of architecture destroyable. 
This became clear in the early 1700s when, by cover of darkness, local Tyrolians wheeled two cannon up here and pulverized Ehrenberg Castle, which was occupied by their enemies, the Bavarians. From this point on, Ehrenberg-style castles were obsolete, and cannon-proof castles like Schlosskopf became the norm. Schlosskopf was built in 1741. Now we see the difference in architecture and fortification. They built here a fortification system 250 meters long, thick walls, eight meters thick walls, tunnels, everything. A real fortification system for cannons. Modern warfare. Mo modern warfare. Hmm. Wow. It's fun. When you know a little bit about it, the visiting experience is much nicer. Hey, we're going to go now to Gimmelwald. If you've been with me for a while, you know I love Gimmelwald, my favorite town in the Swiss Alps. In the book, 40 years ago, I wrote about Gimmelwald. When told you're visiting Gimmelwald, Swiss people assume you mean the famous resort in the next valley, Grindelwald. When assured that Gimmelwald is your target, they lean forward, they widen their eyes, and with a sing-songy Swiss-German accent, they whisper, Und how do you know about Gimmelwald? How do you know about Gimmelwald? It's because you've got that book, Europe Through the Back Door, that finds these amazing places. Let's go to Gimmelwald. And remember, this is one of those little places that are so beautifully preserved because you can't get a building permit to build something big and fancy. Part of the fun and much of the expense of enjoying the Alps is riding the various lifts. Whether you're riding cogwheel trains, steep funiculars, or gondolas, the views are breathtaking. This gondola drops us in the traffic-free village of Gimmelwald. This tiny intersection is the heart of downtown. On a sunny day, you understand why people say, if heaven isn't what it's cracked up to be, send me back to Gimmelwald. The village, established in the Middle Ages, incredibly on the edge of this cliff, was one of the poorest places in Switzerland. Its traditional economy was stuck in the hay. Its farmers make ends meet only with help from Swiss government subsidies and by working the ski lifts in the winter. Modern tourism has perked up the local economy as well. The village operates like a big family. In fact, most of the 120 residents have the same last name, Von Allman. Collecting grass to get their cows through the winter in this rugged terrain is labor intensive. Each hardworking family harvests only enough to feed 15 or 20 cows. Life can be tough, but they'd have it no other way. A generation ago, developers wanted to turn Gimmelwald into a big resort town. The villagers thwarted those plans by getting the entire town declared an avalanche zone. From that point on, no one could get permission to build anything bigger than a house or a barn. Unlike neighboring resort towns, Gimmelwald remains a vital community of families, locally owned and proud of it. Most of the buildings house two families and are divided vertically right down the middle. The writing on the post office building is a folksy blessing. Summer brings green, winter brings snow. The sun greets the day, the stars greet the night. This house will keep you warm. May God give us his blessings. The oldest building in town dates from 1658. Study the log cabin construction. Many are built without nails. Gimmelwald has a strict building code. For instance, shutters can only be natural, green, or white. The stones on the huts are there to keep the shingles from blowing off during strong winter storms. Farmers hang big ceremonial cowbells under their eaves, waiting for that festive day in the spring when the cows move from their barns up to the high meadows. Gimmelwald's accommodations are rustic. A couple simple pensions, b and a hostel, even a barn the hikers sleep in when the cows are in the high meadows. If you want a fancy bed, you're better off in a nearby resort. Okay, our last stop in our review of back doors and uh, is, is uh, a chance to get a little beyond Europe. We are in Asia Minor. We're going to Eastern Turkey, a little town called Guzeliyurt. It means beautiful land, Guzeliyurt. And this is a classic back door. And in this little town, without any earth-shaking sights as such, the big reward is to those who meet the people, meet the imam in the humble little mosque, um, play backgammon with people on the main square, 
and uh, get invited into somebody's home. You can do this and getting into a home is just as important as getting into a museum. Check this out and I hope you can be inspired to have an experience like that yourself when you go to the far reaches of Europe. We're heading further south to the remote and untouristy town of Guzelyurt. The ancient town seems one with the rock out of which it was carved. Sixteen centuries ago, monks built monasteries into the cliffside. Erosion has driven most of the residents here to more stable dwellings, but some remain, and exploring the town, you appreciate the tenacity of its people. Though seemingly abandoned, there's still life in the old town. Residents somehow eke out a living from its crumbling terraces and neglected gardens. People do their humble chores, as if stubbornly refusing to give up on their town. This is the kind of discovery I love to feature in my guidebooks. It's a perfect back door. Almost no tourism, lots of history, and plenty of character. Today, like Turkey in general, Gazilyurt is Muslim. But for centuries, Christians worshipped here. And the city has an interesting connection with Turkey's neighbor to the west, Greece. Until the early 20th century, Greece and Turkey were both part of the Ottoman Empire. There were Muslim communities in Greece and Greek Orthodox communities here in Turkey. Like many Turkish towns, Guzelyurt was once a Greek town. Then, in the 1920s, they had a huge population swap. Most Christians here were moved to Greece, and Muslims there were sent to Turkey. That's why Guzelyurt's historic church is now a mosque. Today, its single minaret indicates that this is a valley where the people call God Allah. Above that 1,600-year-old church are Selçuk arches, Ottoman facades, and on the horizon gleams the tin dome of the main modern mosque. The market square is the heart of Gazelyurt. It's busy with people enjoying petite glasses of sweet chai and the happy clatter of backgammon dice. No, uh, six, six. <laughs> That's good. Look at that. Boom, boom. An easy way to have fun with locals is over a game of backgammon a daily treat for me anywhere in Turkey. If you don't know how to play, it's no problem. If you pause, someone will likely move for you. Oh, nice, huh? Good. Nice game, thank you. Very good. My partner, my good luck. And my friendly opponent, Kadir, is taking us to meet his family. Greetings are warm but formal as is the norm in Muslim households, leave your shoes at the door. The eldest gets the most respect. A splash of cologne leaves us refreshed and clean. Tea making is given great importance and done with pride. And good luck if you want it without sugar. As things loosen up, I share pictures of my children. But now she's quite big. She's like you, about like that, yeah. The daughters add to the fun, and we enjoy a little Turkish fashion show. And the grandfather entertains with tales of 30 years of shepherding. For me, intimate encounters like these are as rewarding as visiting the great museums. All right, well. I hope you enjoyed that little trip down memory lane and a, a thoughtful kind of retrospective on how Europe has changed and how it's remained the same. We've sure had fun teaching it. Hey, Lisa, got some questions? We do have some questions. Before we get to them, though, we need a word from our sponsor, please. Well, thank you for that. You know, I've got a book here called Asia Through the Back Door. <laughs> <laughs> We're not selling that because I think I've only got one or two copies. This is from a long, long time ago. This is the fourth edition of that book. I just really can't get over it. Um, but um, 
uh, what we got is uh, a celebration of uh, the skills of European travel. And when I look at this book, I think of the, it's a collaboration with our whole staff. I mean, you just gave a talk a few weeks ago here on Monday Night Travel about women packing smart. And there's a chapter in here on women packing smart. Uh, there's all the latest on tech in, in Europe. I mean, this is a new age because everybody's got to be a certain amount of techiness to travel smartly these days. They expect it. When you're going to be checking into an airplane or getting a um, qr code for the guided tour at the museum or whatever so we've got all the skills for 2024 in this book it's hot off the press and it's yours if you go to our website ricksteves.com and look in the uh, uh the shopping section there and see them under books you got that with a little 60 or 80 other guide books that we've put together to help people do their travels and also i got to remind people I am so enthusiastic about our tour program. I just spent a week on a guide mentoring tour in Italy. I got to take 20 of our newest guides and let them be on my bus. I got to be the tour guide. These are all professional guides. And I got to just show them the Rick Steves style of guiding so that they could join our team of merry guides. And we would have that uniform kind of personality in our travels, which is experiential, it's respecting the local culture, it is efficient, it is having 25 people on a bus, and in, enjoying the fact that you are in a bus with 25 other travelers because you've got a guide making everything smooth as can be. Hey, um, so if you got any curiosity about our tour program, learn about it at ricksteves.com. All right, Lisa, let's have some questions. Okay, the first question selfishly comes from me. What drove you to catalog your trips in such detail before you were a travel writer? I've been wondering about that. I honestly don't know. I just, this, this journal here, it, it goes back, um, I think I even have my postcards. You guys have seen these before, but these are postcards I wrote when I was 18 years old. And uh, I was so cheap, I had to get three postcards worth of writing out of each, <laughs> out of each stamp, but um, and and if you you were to transcribe these, it's all real. You just take some magnifying glass to read it. Um, but I oh, and I even would uh, modify the multi photograph cover and put a photograph of me in one of those shots of Paris. That's a scary tourist. Can you see me there, Lisa? That's fantastic. Isn't that cool? Is that like a from a photo booth? That's a photo booth. Yeah. And that, that little piece of tape has been on there for more than 50 years. And then under the stamp, many times I would send my parents a little bit of what I was eating, a little bit of sauerkraut. It'd be, it'd be gluten. <laughs> I just wanted to share the, I was having so much fun in Europe. I wanted people to be able to enjoy it. I mean, I, I, this is stone the world here in the Cotswolds. And I'm, I've, I've never read it probably since I wrote it. Uh, but, uh, you can bet this was written the same year I wrote the first edition of this. And I noticed that once I started writing these books, I ran out of energy for these handwritten journals. But I, I think I've got eight years of these and um, they're treasures of mine. And uh, I, to this day, I'm a big fan of journal writing. Uh, when, when we took our kids to Europe, part of the deal was you get your gelato money, but you got to write a journal. And it's a treasured souvenir for, for any, any child that goes to Europe. Yeah. By the way, in the Q&A, there are some people suggesting that Rick Steves Europe needs an archivist. I think we probably do because there's some beautiful stuff that, um, I think I've got it here. I, I can, I've got the original of this. This is a fresco I made on the plane going home. Can you see that? Yeah, right there, 1973. That's in good shape because it hasn't faded. Uh -huh. But Gene and I wrote that on the flight going home, and it's got each episode on our trip that was unforgettable. From the day oh, that's the one her. with the toilet you showed on the other Keep on Trucking show. <laughs> that's it. So, uh, but yeah, we need an archive, Lisa. Let's put that in our list when we get uh, <laughs> a moment. Okay. Um, Mike wants to know, did you do most of your early traveling as a solo traveler by yourself? Or has that changed over the years? Um, my first years, I went with um, friends from college, girlfriends, roommates, you know, I always liked to have a buddy with me. Um, and then when I got to be more uh, professional, ever since I've been in my late 20s, I have been alone because I've had an agenda just to go, go, go. And it hasn't been really a vacation. It's been a passion to experience things and write about them. 
and I'm not very polite, to be honest, when I'm alone working in Europe. It's just get out of my way. I got stuff to do. I'm, I'm just, I'm not that fun. <laughs> but uh, what my body waits for is the time when I'm going to be guiding a tour. Because then, whether it's eight people on a minibus or 25 people on a big bus, my body knows I'm going to get good food and good company when I'm on tour because we're all having a good time socially. But when I'm alone, it's, it's pretty hard driven because I've got a lot to see and do. Europe is a huge place. I imagine that even in the old days when you were in between tours, you were working on something. Yeah, I really was. Um, I just don't understand it really, but um, you know, uh, I can't get enough of it. I love it. Oh, you're sharing your love. You said yeah. it already. Yeah, and we're amplifying it now. I mean, we're just amplifying it um, expertly with the with the uh, technology we've got and uh, and all of our the collaboration we do with our team. It's it's pretty nice and uh, um, yeah, it's I'm it's a blessing to find your niche and uh, have it work out as work as a job, you know. Um, and uh, and also I get I get direct gratification because I meet people who are having the time of their life and they they thank me for. A, for experiences they had in places I've never been. They just want to thank that. People go, oh, Rick, thanks for the Azores. What am I going to say? You're welcome. <laughs> Azores. <laughs> um, OK, serious question. Do you see bed and breakfast surviving in, through the next 40 years? I loved the B&Bs in, in the old days. Um, it was a charming thing because everybody was more was less affluent. All you had was an extra room and you rented it out and you'd let them you'd make breakfast for them and, and you'd take 20 bucks and it would, it would bolster your family budget. Now it's really expensive. It's really private. It's really dolled up and uh, it's allowing people to live uh, away from that and hire somebody else to run it like a little business and B and B's are becoming atomized hotels. A whole neighborhood is peppered with B&Bs, and there's one, I've noticed there's one little corner uh, conciergerie, a, a check-in desk, and you go there when you run out of toilet paper. You leave your bag there when you got to check out early. You go there when you lost your key, you know. I mean, that's the front desk for 25 disparate B&Bs all around, and the people who own those B&Bs, they willingly give away 25% of the gross to have somebody run the thing there and hand out the keys and change the sheets. Uh, so it's impersonal now. And, and traditionally a B&B &B was personal. You had tea and watched, you know, hurling on TV. Uh, and uh, you'd go to the church and play the pipe organ. I, I mean, a couple of times I got to go to a church and play the pipe organ because the people I was staying with uh, went to that church and were the organists there. Uh, that doesn't happen really anymore. So. It's all part of affluence. We're all driving it up. You know, I've told our staff, we cannot continually make the worst hotel on our tours better because it just becomes this spiral up and all of a sudden everything becomes really demanding, really expensive, less accessible to people that don't have a lot of money. And um, it doesn't always need to be fancier and more affluent. In so many ways, the down home gritty, salt of the earth experience is by definition less expensive that's the magic that we have to it's great to be affluent and to be able to fly here and have a wonderful dinner there and drink you know a fine glass of wine but if that gets in the way of just getting together with people like b and b's is a good example then it's a shame all right um let me see um, CJ asks, what is the greatest innovation in travel in the last 40 years and the worst? The greatest innovation in travel in the last 40 years is this. And the worst innovation in travel in the last 40 years is this. <laughs> This can be your best friend or this can undermine your experience. Think about how to use it in a way that connects you with Europe and saves you, you know, time and money. And uh, think about ways not to let it keep you away from being in the moment. 
That's a tough challenge. It is a tough challenge. It's a challenge for all of us. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. Um, you, GPS is a fascinating thing. I mean, I love GPS, but it's it's caused people to not really understand maps. It's a very interesting cultural gap with somebody who grew up using maps and somebody who's never used a map and always just typed it in. Um, you know, I go, to, I get a taxi now and I, who doesn't speak my language and he hands me his phone and I just type in where I'm going. And then he follows that. He has no idea where it is. He just follows it. He didn't learn a thing. You know, um, I like the old days when I would learn the lay of the land through the map. And then at a glance, I could get there without constantly saying at the next turn, go left. And at the next three intersections, take a right. You know, I had a broader context of where I was going. Um, there's, um, you know, we have time is a limited resource and money is a limited resource. We want to do stuff that saves our time and saves our money, but we have to be mindful of what, what enhances the experience. And um, that's not always a tech solution. I'm a big fan of asking people for directions because especially as a woman traveling by myself, a lot of times I can't just go up to people and talk to them necessarily, especially right. if it's a man, but I'm like, uh, is this the way to the church? We used to do that, Lisa, on our very first tours, I would stop and I would ask a, an old farmer on the roadside or whatever, a question just so he would come up close to the window and everybody on my minibus could see the twinkle in his eyes and hear his accent. It was just great. And then a couple of blocks later, I'd ask the same question to another person just because it was a way to connect. And it was fun for the farmer that get to see, you know, eight Americans. And it was fun for eight Americans to meet that farmer. There's that twinkle in the eye that if you can find a way to connect that way, um, those become little sparks of positive energy in your travel experience. Absolutely. Okay. Peppa asks, how has your experience of Europe changed between being an anonymous young traveler and a well-known travel authority? Well, I've got friends all over Europe that I can call on to uh, help me out when I need to in my work. Um, but generally when I'm traveling, uh, and I've got an appreciation of having a good guide. I have to admit, I've generally, because I want to get the most out of my time, I have a guide at my side. I travel alone, but um, I've got my itinerary coming up for my next trip, and uh, I've just been working on it. I think I've got it right here. And if you look at my itinerary, every um, every day there's a, a G10 and a G6 on every day. And each one of those has a guide that I'll meet for sightseeing in the day and then for restaurants and activities in the evening. And that's gonna make sure that that if I'm walking around and I go, oh, why is that that way? And what happened here? And what happens if I do that? And why do they do it that way? Boom, 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 boom. I've got it all. So that that just lets me just learn so much and discover so much and write it all down. And I have to, it's a tough thing, but I have to stop doing that and stay in the hotel room and write it all up. Or it just, I get buried in all of these ideas and these tips and then the consequence is nothing gets into the guidebook because I get overwhelmed by it. So you know what that's like, because you do a lot of that research too. It's just, you got to stop and then tidy up all your notes and get it all put thoughtfully into the book. And then you go out again. It's like, you know, you go out again and you gather more information. I just love that. Okay. Last question. It's an easy one. Jan wants to know any new travel shows in the works? Yeah, right now we're working on two Iceland shows and two Poland shows that we shot this year or last year, and I'm very excited about them. They're coming along beautifully, and I'm going to be filming with our crew. We've booked it already, uh, 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 Best of Paris show and a barging show, barging through Burgundy while eating gourmet French food. Uh, this is going to be the most a hedonistic thing we've ever filmed. I think it's fair to say we're going to be gliding slowly through the vineyards of Burgundy, the finest wine in the world. And the crew running our little barge is going to be the captain, the first mate and our chef. And each day we're going to go to markets and we're going to go shopping together. And we're going to sit on that deck as we glide on vacation through Burgundy. And we're going to enjoy eating our way 
through traditional French cuisine. I just am so excited about that. And those are shows that will be coming your way with lots more shows uh, on public television. Right now, our Mighty Alp show is airing all over the country. I'm really excited about that. And I'm also excited about the ability to go into our website in Classroom Europe and pull together clips from the shows. Everything I showed tonight was assembled in 10 minutes by going to Classroom Europe and typing in those places and putting them in a playlist. And then I can just have my playlist and share it with you. So this is something we've offered for teachers and it works very well for travelers as well as teachers. If you haven't played around with Classroom Europe, check it out. It's right on the homepage, Classroom Europe. Hey, Lisa, thank you so much for moderating tonight. I want to thank everybody for traveling with us. We so look forward to our Monday nights where we can get together. I'm excited about next, mon next Monday because we're going to Umbria. And the Monday after that, we're going to Budapest. And we hope that you are part of our travel plans and that we can be part of your travel plans. Thank you so much. Happy travels. And um, thanks for going down a trip down memory lane with me. As I recall, how Europe has evolved and how our teaching has evolved from 40 editions of this book. Keep on traveling, baby. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you everyone for being with us. We will see you next week on in Umbria. Good night, Lisa. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.